I think maybe we'll make a start now. If people are still coming in, that's fine. But um, we've got a lot to cover and only an hour to do it in. <clears throat> We're talking about how to do research on top of everything else and still have a life, uh, which is important. Um, when I wrote my first research methods book, I felt very strongly about this because research is often written about as if it exists in a bubble in isolation. And of course it doesn't. Research exists alongside all of the rest of our lives and our families and our hobbies and our, um, you know, all of the things we might like to do, our friends, our um, volunteer work, whatever, whatever it is that we do, and our jobs. Sometimes it's sometimes research is someone's job, but sometimes it's off, more often perhaps it's on top of someone's job that they have to do research. Uh, so we're going to spend an hour thinking about uh, how to do all that. I'm an independent researcher myself. I've been one since 1999 and I've been an independent scholar since 2011 and I've written a bunch of books. Um, the one that today is really about is this one which is now in its third edition with Policy Press, Research and Evaluation for Busy Students and Practitioners, a survival guide uh, which is to help you understand how to survive having to do research or evaluation and ideally also thrive. Um, I'm hoping it's not just the, the most basic bottom line survival thing. Uh, so little bits of housekeeping. Um, please type any questions in the Q&A function rather than the chat, um, unless they're questions for our um, Bristol University Press Policy Press colleagues, uh, like the one about whether the session is being recorded, which they've just answered. That's fine to put those in the chat. But questions for the panellists, um, please put those in the Q&A. We've got a couple in there already, which is great and you can vote them up and down. If you see a question that you like in the Q&A and you want it to be asked, you can vote for it to be asked and then it will be asked. Um, I will be getting to those towards the end of the session. And of course, the questions with most upvotes are most likely to be asked. There is, a, there is scope to order each of our books at a 50% discount, which is very generous from Policy Press. Um, there's a special code, which I'm just going to pop in the chat now. Um, I think it's, it's have a life 50, which is a nice code. I think have a life at 50 is also a good code, but you know, this is the one they've chosen. Um, they're also offering a free ebook of my book on creative research methods, which is a different book currently in its second edition, that one. Um, so if you want a free ebook of that, they're going to put a link to a form in the chat where you can sign up and add your name and email address and they will email a copy over to you. Um, if you've got any technical issues, please use the chat. Um, because this is a webinar, you won't be able to actually come on and speak or put your hand up, uh, but you can use the chat for anything you need to ask about and the Q&A for questions for the panellists. We do have closed captions enabled on this webinar. There's a button at the bottom of the screen uh, called CC Live Transcript that you should be able to find. Um, or captions in the more section. Uh, if you want to put the captions on, then you can do that uh, or toggle it. It's a toggle, so you can click it again to switch them off. Um, now, I was just about to go to Jennifer Lee, but she's disappeared. I know she's been having some problems with her connection. Uh, so I'm hoping she's going to come back in a minute. Uh, but I think in the meantime, we may have to start with you instead, Ilaria, if that's okay. Um, of course, hello. The, let me just give you a quick introduction. Ilaria Boncori, we're delighted to have with us. She's Professor in Management and Marketing and Deputy Dean Postgraduate Research Training at the University of Essex. And she's a critical management scholar whose research focuses on inequality in organisations, qualitative methods and writing differently. All things I'm very interested in too, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us, Ilaria. Go ahead. Hello um, and welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see to see so many of you and from so many different parts of the world in the chat. So um, as I said before uh, to a colleague, I usually deliver a two hour session on, on prioritizing and time management. So I'm going to condense that into eight minutes of what I think is really the focus. So the first thing, if we're thinking of prioritization is, do you want to think of how to do research and have a life? Or do you want to think of having a life and how you still want to do research and, and an academic career? So already, I think we, we think about what is important to us, but also what is our priority at this point in our lives? Because I think very often our uh, ability to prioritize things or, you know, uh, 
what we can prioritize, what we want to prioritize changes throughout our career. Um, so I am like 43. I have two children, one of whom is six uh, years old and the other one is nine months old. So I've had to prioritize quite a lot over the past year of things that I can or cannot do. Um, so you sometimes you find yourself in situations where everything seems important. Um, everything is a priority, everything is urgent. And so it's really hard to think, you know, both in your personal life and in your career, how do I prioritize? And I think you will find lots of different models on prioritizing, you know, different techniques and so on. And actually one thing that has helped me personally, but also my mentees is to think about, um, First, your tasks and then your time. So we'll start with your, your tasks, the things that you want to prioritize or that you need to prioritize. So I think about it as a relationship between impact and effort. So some things, and whether it's your private life or you know, your work life, some things have a great impact and require great effort, which you know is laborious, but is good. Some things require a lot of effort and time commitment and very little impact. So those are the things that we try to deprioritize. Some things have little impact and little effort. So if we have a way of saying no to those things, that's the, the one thing that you should try to postpone or delegate or just get rid of really. Um, you also want to think about what has an impact or effort in terms of long-term and short-term commitment. And I think this to me sounds really strategic and ha it has worked really well. Sometimes you also have um, life commitments. So is my fourth external examining uh, job this year high impact, high effort? Not really, not so much. However, that allows me to pay for people to help with my house chores which is having a great impact on my personal life because it means I can spend my Sundays with my family rather than, than cleaning up the house and getting more tired than I am. So some things might not have strong impact and, and, and effort on one side of your life, but actually the, the, the impact on your other side might be great. The other thing is what do you love? So sometimes uh, there are projects that might not have a huge impact on your daily work or your career, but that's your love project. And so you are getting empowered or re-energized. And sometimes that is just like running every morning at six o'clock, not for myself, but for some people it is. And sometimes it's just carving out time for reading or attending a conference where you know that some colleagues are going to be um, speaking at. And so, so I think looking at prioritizing in terms of impact, effort, and what you love is, is something that might help you have a, a hierarchy of, of tasks and, and items to look after. The other thing is, um, and I had a conversation with this a colleague the other day ago, uh, the, the, a week ago, um, and it's about you know health and well-being and work. Um, and so, you know, very often if we're very busy, uh, it also means that we have big workloads. Sometimes we have to take work home, which I have been much better at not doing since I, I, I had children. When I didn't have children, I stayed in the office late. My husband is two doors down. So it helped me to just have that flexibility. However, when that flexibility meant taking time away from my family and my children. It just simply, I just simply couldn't do that. Um, it also means, you know, stress, mental health. And I think um, the balance or balance is, I think, maybe ambitious, but the, you know, the interplay between life and work life is, is really important. And obviously health and well-being should always come first. Linked to prioritizing is also time management. And I've had to become really, really good at this over the, the past few years. And so some um, tools that might work for colleagues are, for example, first thing, absolutely understand what works best for you. So understanding yourself. When is your most productive time of the day? When is your you know, least productive time? So, sorry, that's my phone. 
Um, so when is, for example, I someone might need a routine. So someone might want to work on their writing every day, first thing in the morning between eight and 10. So I know that my brain is not at its best at the first thing in the morning. So my peak of productivity is actually between, between 11 and two. So know yourself, know how you like to work. I don't like to work every day on the same thing, which for example, other colleagues love to do. I like to dedicate a big chunk of time, say a whole day, to something. So I might have to wait for a couple of weeks before I can afford to have a whole day to dedicate to something, but that is most productive for myself. Um, also look at how you invest your time linked with your priorities. Are you spending too much time on things that are not a priority? And do you have a say in how you can manage your time and other people's time if they work with you? So I, for example, work really well with visualizations. I don't know if you can see that. You see these, what, other side, these two are my visualization boards for my research projects. So to look at the progress of my research projects, I put them on a time scale of things that have been accepted, there's the work in progress, you know, initial ideas, and that helps me keep track of lots of different projects. Um, the other thing that I do is to manage my calendar, uh, both my family calendar at home and my work calendar religiously like with attention. So I block out times. Uh, otherwise, my role is very meeting heavy. And so I end up just being back to back in meetings without having time to actually do the work or pick up my children, for example. So um, it's really important for me to also plan ahead because um, you never know. I think COVID has taught us that, you know, life is unpredictable and, you know, my children get sick of the, all the time through nursery. I might have an urgent meeting or an urgent project that I need to work on. And so for me, it really helps to, to just plan ahead and get organized as much as possible. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you, Ilaria, and for being on time, which is also awesome. I'm going to move straight on to Jennifer Lee, but I will just remind people, do please use the Q&A for questions for the panellists. And if you have questions um, about the tech or the codes or anything, please put those in the chat. Um, so Jennifer Lee, who we're going to hear from next, is a reader in the School of Social Policy and Social Science Research at the University of Kent with a particular interest in using embodied, reflective and creative practices for social justice. Over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, firstly, I should apologise for my internet connection um, and to say that when I first saw the, the title of this talk, um, I thought it was about as likely as seeing low flying pigs over the unicorn, particularly bearing in mind that I am currently at school delivering outreach um, and hiding in a room that is not the room that was booked for me, but another one because there was an emergency meeting. Anyway, moving on, I'm going to be sharing some of the uh, uh, some of the things that have been written in this book, uh, Women in Supramolecular Chemistry, um, which was written and co-authored with supramolecular chemists. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about it and also um, to a little bit of the research that it draws on. So. Um, the, the, the Supramolecular Chemistry Network is one of the, um, one of its aims is to support the progression and retention of women. And uh, the book draws on work that has been published in leading chemistry journals, such as Angavanta Chemie and in Chem. And we've also written a, comment, a series of comment pieces on um, aspects of family life for nature reviewed chemistry, all of which were available at, um, open access. Um, and obviously any kind of marginalization isn't just to do with gender, it has to be looked at intersectionally. So we've also done a, an article and two book chapters in press around disability and science. Um, and we work with an organization called Empowering Female Minds in STEM who look to promote uh, women in Africa to, uh, to do and to study and to work in science. So I'm gonna start with uh, reading a little bit from the introduction of the book. Um, one of WISC's aims is to build community and to create a sense of kinship for women and those who are marginalised. Um, while academia remains a stereotypically masculine and isolated place that it was designed to be, a place free from children, romantic relationships and personal problems and lives, it can be intimidating for women to talk openly about their personal lives. 
Sue Rosser wrote that no one likes to feel as if they must give up their femininity, motherhood, or another characteristic that they view as core to their identity in order to fit into their profession. Now, things have come a long way since 1988, when Trawick described the laboratory as a man's world. But women in those from minority backgrounds are still underrepresented, particularly at the more senior levels, making the journey towards full professorship appear daunting. For those who persevere, it can be hard to find success due to conscious, unconscious or systemic bias, and it can be isolating as a member of a minority group. Um, Storming the tower is a lonely business, as any academic woman who has tried can tell you, is a quote from Stiver and O'Leary. Marginalisation in higher education is often thought to correlate with characteristics of the individual, such as colour, ethnicity, disability, class and access. In terms of gender, we know that women in academia are disproportionately affected by funding structures, academic culture, research environments, caring responsibilities. And a body of work exists on academic identity and women's lived experiences as they negotiate and resist structural inequalities. However, the voices of women in STEM and their embodied stories are largely absent, which is where this book comes in. Um, our intentions for this work was for it to reflect the experiences of those engaged with projects that are run by WISC and to find points that resonated with each other, wider members of WISC and the scientific community. We wanted to find the human points of connection that allowed others to realise the impact and lived experiences that we shared. In order to achieve this, we used a variety of methods and um, with an emphasis on creativity and embodied experience experiences and we also include fictional vignettes which are drawn from the data and images from research like this one um, and it was our choice to use fictional narratives to create vignettes that resonated with the experiences in order to protect the anonymity of our participants they draw on experiences shared within surveys reflective research group meetings and collaborative autobiography and the team worked together to choose themes that resonated for us which were then disseminated within the wider community to get feedback and input so these stories are true but they're not real our original intention was to capture and explore the lived experiences of running a research group as a woman. However, the timing of the project meant that in addition, we also had the scope to capture and explore the lived experiences of being a woman in supermolecular chemistry in academia through the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. The group shared how this pandemic affected them. There was a lot of fear about the unknown and most had been inundated with teaching and meetings, which had pivoted to being online, experiences that took longer and required more energy than in person. One said she felt like I'm in an episode of Doctor Who where the laptop sucks my living energy and my soul. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find the right bit. Um, throughout the project, the group became close, maybe closer than expected as they shared honest and authentic reflections of their lives. And this connection allowed them to reveal things that they would not necessarily feel comfortable admitting to others in a work scenario. One, uh, one member said, it's week four of homeschooling and the wheels are falling off. We were told today that schools won't open until early March at the earliest. I'm working 7 a.m. till midnight. I can't continue at this level. I'm so run down. On Friday, instead of a nap, I looked at paper drafts. I need a career building momentum of papers after maternity leave. I was only just getting momentum. I want to read to you one of the fictional vignettes. Um, this is from the perspective of Addie, who's 23 and an international PhD student. I don't think I want to stay in academia. I don't know what I want to do yet. There's a big part of me that wants to use my degree as I've worked so hard and spent so much time on it. But I don't think academia is for me. For one thing, I don't see any faculty who look like me. There aren't any black women in my department. And I look at my supervisor and I see all the hours that she works. Last year, I know she was in the lab until 11 or 12 p.m. every night. She tells us that she has to work that much just to get things done and she's not even a professor yet. There never seems to be any time to take stock of where we are and everything that we've done. As soon as something works, we just move on to the next thing. Before COVID, we used to celebrate in the pub if the group published a paper, but these days it just doesn't happen. It can't happen. And I don't think it's only my supervisor either. I remember how burnt out all my lecturers looked when I was an undergrad, always rushing from one thing to another. It's not that they didn't help. They did, or I wouldn't be here now, but I don't think it's what I want for myself. Someone I know got a job as a lecturer straight after a postdoc. It's almost unheard of, right? But he has to do so much teaching and with everything online, I can see it's almost breaking him. At least my group isn't as bad as some. One friend I know is expected to work 11 hours a day, six days a week, and her supervisor regularly sets meetings at 8pm on a Friday night. I don't think I could cope with that. I want to have a life.
stress that I just seem to cope with on a day to day basis and see as normal now, worrying about not getting enough data, worrying when things don't work, worrying that I'm not living up to the huge sacrifices I made to come here. So much worry and fear. Friends and only seeing them a few times a year is horrible. I worry that when things aren't working, I'm letting my supervisor down. I have to live up to all of the expectations of me and make this worthwhile. My whole support network is in another country. There are wellbeing services and things at university. Waiting list is so long, it's like I'll graduate before I get any real help. My mental health is definitely suffering. As an international student, the worry about the financial and emotional cost of my PhD is huge. And every time I want to apply for any kind of financial help, they ask for a million things and really intrusive information, so I just give up. Even if I did want to stay, it's not as though getting a job is easy. There are so few positions out there and everywhere people are being made redundant. I heard somewhere that a CV that won't get you into a postdoc these days would have been better than one that would have got you tenure 30 years ago. It's as though expectations just keep going up and up and up and the pressure goes up with them. I also know I want to have a family and I just don't see how that's possible in academia. None of the really senior women I see in the field have children. I know that there are more younger ones coming through who've had kids or are having kids, but who knows if they'll make it to professor? There's so much holding women back in the field. Doesn't being a mum just make it harder? How could I be the kind of parent I want to be and work that hard? That said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Industry seems to be almost as bad. Maybe publishing or editing is the way forward. Somewhere where I can use my science, but also have a life. So we took film uh, cameras into the labs as well. And I particularly like this image after the, the last vignette because I actually left science um, when I was an undergraduate to have a, a child and then went back. And this pink haired beauty is my oldest who is now finishing a PhD in chemistry. I'm going to finish by reading um, the final vignette in the book, which is from the perspective of Phyllis, who's 63 and a senior researcher. It was different in my day. There just weren't enough women about to have any sense of a community. I can see the difference it makes for the younger ones coming through to have enough of a critical mass to make a difference to each other. It felt very lonely back then. It still does in a way. I think choices were starker. You either had to decide career over family or career after family. Although that could mean that you just never progressed as far as your male colleagues. I don't have children. I've had relationships, but I've never met a man that could cope with me prioritizing my career in the way I had to. There've been so many women and men doing work to change things. It does make me wonder why young women are still facing the same barriers and having to make the same choices we did 30 years ago. But I suppose at least there are more of them making them. I do think there's a real willingness to learn and to do things differently though. I mean, I can count the number of times I haven't heard some version of you only got that because you're a woman when I've shared funding or publication success or when I was made a fellow. I think the more of us who are senior can stand up and shout and lend our names and support to the ones coming through, the better. I mentor where I can, both officially and unofficially. What makes me so proud is that I see my male colleagues doing the same, really championing young women. I know we need to address all kinds of diversity in chemistry. Goodness knows we don't have enough range of skin colour, but I am hopeful. I appreciate that they recognise the hard work we all put in by doing our best to change things. And in some ways, just by being here and achieving what we have achieved, at least they have role models of a sort, more than I ever did. I want to be hopeful. I see all these brilliant young women and I see them not dropping out, not leaving to a different profession, but staying and having families and getting their grants and getting their papers out. One showed me a mug the other day that her wife had bought her. Now, what did it say? Oh yes, girls just want to have funding for scientific research. I thought that was a hoot. I'm sometimes amazed by how bold this new generation are and how brave for calling out behavior they'll not put up with. I'm not sure that I could have back then. It felt much too risky. A lot more was just accepted as well. If you ask me what I want for this new generation, I'd say I want them to keep on being brilliant, to keep on being bold, to have ideas and to challenge us old dinosaurs. I love the way they smile and wave and get us all on side. And it makes us want to work with them. And it keeps us on our toes as well. I want them to have opportunities for scientific research, to have families, to have a life and to have fun. I want them to remember that academia won't love you as much as the people in your life will, that it won't necessarily reward their long hours or dedication. It will take and take and take. I've heard it described as a consensual abusive relationship and that hit home a bit. I want those coming through to have healthy, meaningful relationships with their work and the rest of their lives. And I want them to keep fighting for themselves and for each other and to really change the culture of chemistry and science so that no one is marginalised anymore. And so that what really matters is the science. So thank you. I hope I didn't run over too much and that you let the internet uh, 
managed to stay. Um, I promise you this is the QR code that yesterday led to the open access version of this book. My uh, middle daughter who studies computer science says you should never scan a random QR code, but I'm trying to assure you it is, it's available on the Bristol, um, Bristol University Press website as well. So thank you. Lovely, thank you, Jennifer. And last but not at all least, is my colleague Su Ming Ku. We have worked together um, on various books, like, for example, this one, uh, another policy press book, which I thought I would just hold up for people to see, which I think will also be available at a 50% discount if you want it. Um, and Su Ming is Senior Lecturer in Political Science and Sociology at the National University of Ireland in Galway. She specialises in critical development studies, human rights, higher education and decolonial and transdisciplinary approaches. Sue, so, over to you. Okay, let me just um, unmute. Yes, and I'll just start my timer so I don't go over. So just to maybe um, take a minute to uh, wonder why you've asked me onto this panel of um, how to do uh, research and still have a life, considering I'm the kind of person who has more or less managed to completely integrate my life into my research and writing work and um, who's generally quite chaotic and busy. I'm terrible at um, time management, uh, but I do manage it quite a lot done, including four books with Helen since uh, 2020, which is quite amazing. And um, maybe to acknowledge some of the things um, that uh, Jennifer has um, spoken about, but I like to go a little bit further than that. And I think something that Jennifer, there's been an undercurrent in some of the messages that Jennifer has been dealing with in her field of supramolecular, supramolecular chemistry, stuff that I can't even pronounce, um, is the sense of something happening in academia that's making academia not a nice place to be. And um, I was recently reading a book by David Theo Goldberg, a, a South African writer, about dread. Dread being the sense of futureless futures. And I think the first and foremost thing uh, in being a researcher and still having a life is to think of our work as having a life in the future so that we're not just surviving in a limited life but that there is not the sense of dread that we are boiling, you know, the frog sitting in boiling water, the water is getting hotter. Uh, like supposedly the frogs don't notice and they just get boiled because they don't notice. And I don't want us to be the frogs. So to recognize that there's the sense of dread, to acknowledge that and to ask really what is happening. And how are we becoming part of this thing where we are normalizing saying academic academia, this world that we love and that we've given our lives to will not love us back and will not give us life. And to push back against that and to occupy and take back that which um, we've worked hard to have in our professions as either independent researchers or as tenured researchers or as precarious researchers trying to make our living and have our lives um, in this world. And I've just come back from a very busy and exhausting research trip. And the first and foremost thing that I want to say is that research gives you life. It doesn't take it away from you. Is, um, and the reason why is that research isn't just about the topic. It isn't just about you becoming a brilliant researcher and having a brilliant idea and finding the brilliant evidence or the brilliant interpretation and writing a brilliant paper or a brilliant book. Research is about relationships and our friends. And this above all is what is going to save us from the sense of dread and give us a future full future is the relationships that we trust and the relationships that we believe in. And we first have to acknowledge that we're coming to this after a very different time when all the bad things were, that were happening already in academia seem to have had a magnifying glass put on them. And this is uh, an effect that we noticed first and foremost when we started writing about our experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic, which actually hasn't gone away, though we are kind of pretending that it's gone away. 
So um, the first thing then is to acknowledge that we have come out of extraordinary times. And in those extraordinary times, our time has got more crammed. It's become more intense. We've been working harder and we're feeling frazzled and burnt out. So I just want to acknowledge that and to say, I see that and I notice it. Yeah, because one of the things I've noticed is that um, when Helen and I these did this very fast books, the rapid e-books on doing research in a time of COVID, we start, we organized the books in two, three titles. So these are, are e-books that you are quite reasonably priced and you can get them at 50% off, which is great. Yeah. Um, uh, researching in a time of COVID-19. So um, co volume one, the first volume was um, response and reassessment, acknowledging that something cataclysmic had happened and research would have to change. Volume two was about care and resilience. So that was about taking a moment, acknowledging what was happening. And as human beings, what do we have to focus on? So the first thing we have to focus on is care of ourselves, our families, our friends, uh, our fellow people, our humanity and the world. And we were doing that during the pandemic. That put a magnifying glass on actually practices of care, thinking about what other people need to be kept safe, behaving in a way that really changing our behavior seriously to enable that. And, and also what is it that makes us able to continue caring, continuing being surviving, continuing our family lives, continuing to be researchers. And then the third volume was creativity and ethics. And we've done more work coming out of that now. And I've just been workshopping quite a bit of work out of that. And really seeing that when you focus on care and resilience, when you see the flexibility and the adaptability that is in you as a researcher, but acknowledging that you're also a person who has responsibilities to other people, to care about them and to care for them and to be responsive and responsible towards them. Um, and you know that in the present, but also in the future. And knowing that we're doing this in a time when actually precaritization has been, has been accentuated by the pandemic. So now we have new research coming out, like I'm, I'm coming from Ireland and we've just new research coming out that shows that um, just about half now of our teaching staff in universities are precariously employed. So that's now a norm. It's not something that's separate. Yeah. So it's something that's completely changing the fabric of our existence. So having taken a minute just to think about that and to acknowledge and you know confess that I'm not really a very good person at time management but I do take time because time is not given to us yeah time is taken away from us by many burdensome administrative tasks and tasks that are that don't actually generate the work the research the science or the good relationships and they're often tasks which create um, not good relationships, re relationships of authoritarianism, of being given orders, being told to get on it, uncaring uh, relationships that test our resilience. So part of resilience and being creative in our resilience is also to take our time back and push back against those pointless um, administrative jobs that take our time and continuously demand more. Because I, as I say, they're kind these administrative tasks, bureaucratic tasks, like meeting based tasks, which only produce more meetings is we can actually push back and say, do we really need a meeting about this? Because maybe not. Send me an email. Yeah, and we'll deal with it in this 10 minute slot and I'll deal with it, you know, by writing to about it. We don't need another meeting about this. So pushing back against that and investing, investing in the relationships that are going to enable you to do your research because they're your research collaborators, they are your research colleagues, they are research, your research friends. And so that's really all I have to say in my uh, allotted time. Um, I'm not sure that I've really covered what I meant to cover, but um, hopefully um, we'll all still be able to survive and look after each other and look after ourselves and think about working and living our life in a way that isn't going to make our futures less futureful. Lovely, thank you. And I think it's been so interesting because the contributions from our three panelists have 
all been focused on the topic of the webinar, but from very different angles and perspectives. And I think that's really useful uh, to widen out the debate and the discussion. And um, there's a little bit of applause in the chat for you there, Suming Ku, I'm glad to say. And there were some compliments for Laria earlier and uh, for Jennifer too. So we have, chat, we have some questions. We do have a bunch of questions, which I'm not seeing in order of upvotes. So I'm just gonna whip through and see Oh, yeah. OK, right. So the the most popular question is. For it doesn't specify for which panelist oh, I can. Apparently I can change a setting. Oh, yes, I can. Marvellous. Thanks, Jess. Um, this is from somebody who has chosen to remain anonymous, which is fine. If working part time or with caring responsibilities, how do you effectively compete for grants or promotion with people who are able and willing to work 50 hour weeks? Uh, so I don't know who wants to um, chip in straight on first on that. Which of you would like to get going on a response to that? I can just say if you like, like I'm full time, but I, you know, my full time, my research contract is 40 percent of my time. Right. And 40 percent is on teaching. So firstly, think about how the other things that you spend your time on, significant time on, actually uh, complement your research and integrate with them. So we are often told that our teaching is the enemy of the research, whereas, of course, for me, I think I do all research based teaching. And obviously, it depends on what else that you're doing outside of your 50 percent contract. So part of that may be seeing, um, you know, where's the relevance and also being realistic, I think, about the success rates. So um, doing a bit of research around success rates because we've become busier than ever. So we need to take time to reflect on um, how we balance the productivity with investing in better relationships. And so I would say invest in those research grant applications and so on, because generally we're working in a, in a, in a, a scenario of quite low success rates. So you've got to really only want to apply for things. So I've actually started to say, you know, deciding to apply for things a bit later and not feeling that you're in this comp competition, because the problem is that the competition is so high anyway, that it's not a straightforward competition. Like typically I'm applying for grants, which have a success rate of less than 5%. So therefore, I mean, you might as well buy a lottery ticket. So really just invest in the things that you are interested in and see the unsuccessful application if it's likely to be unsuccessful as an investment in a future more successful application and don't get dragged into thinking that you have to compete with everyone because there are so many types of people that you have to compete with that you just basically die of exhaustion from competition competition does not give you anything it only burns you out and takes away so just do the best application only apply for things that you you want and that you think are really interesting and yeah, and apply, you know, normally there's some collaboration element. Think of who you want to work with. Well, will really make your life joyful and excellent when 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 you actually get the funding that you dreamed of. And yeah, apparently this is a successful uh, my my crazy advice is a bit successful because other people who have followed this advice are now suddenly getting some success. Great, thank you. Is there anything, Ilaria, you want to add something to that? Go ahead. Yes, I think it's really important about sort of like managing your expectations where you have agency also and thinking about different stages in your career. So, so there are some things that you don't have uh, control over, right? So this is also um, linking up with some comments and questions uh, later on. So for example, in the UK, so I've had experience of the UK system, the Italian system and the Chinese system as an academic and the UK system is ruthless. So it's, you know, we can context, oh, actually the book, which looks like this, sorry, I haven't shown you before. So the first chapter in my book is about neoliberal academia. So it's academia that is premised on basically commercial 
ideas and metrics that are quantitative. And so you have to be excellent at everything, produce more, better, faster, it's impossible, right? So it's impossible. We can't all do everything. So I know that, for example, at this stage in my career, and yes, I am a professor, but in the UK, it doesn't mean that you can just sit and relax and publish whatever you want and your job is safe. It's not, uh, unlike some other contexts. Um, you have to publish a certain number of outputs at a certain level, top level, of course, always, you need to get grants for funding, you need to have impacts on society. And these are criteria for your promotion in some places, but not in all places, right? So I think you need to think about what you have agency over. So you maybe you cannot just look at what is interesting, but you can try to find a balance. I think it's also really important to like I know that I will, at this stage in my career, I cannot do visiting scholar professors. Well, maybe I could, but I don't want to because I have a nine months old baby and I cannot travel as much. And I want, I could work evenings and weekends, but I've decided not to, because I want to prioritize my family. And I will not have 6 million citations and I will not write 6 million books because that's, that's not what I've decided. But maybe that will be my place in 10 years time. You know, so I think I think it's also like thinking about competing. Who are you competing with? And yes, in many academic contexts, academia is built on exclusion of lack of equity. It is built on the unencumbered, normatively abled male academics is gender. Yes. Yes, it is. So so I think, you know, that is that is true. And um, I talk about it in my book as well. Um, but this is why I think it's important to prioritize, but also to find your tribe. And I think what Suming was, you know, it is about relationship, a lot of it. So find the people who enable you rather than just take away from you. And it has taken me about 10 years as a foreigner in the UK to build that understanding and network, but it is, a game changer for me, both in terms of mental well-being, emotional well-being, and work, uh, work priorities and performance. Okay, we're going to have to go a bit quicker in this question answering thing because we we have a bunch more. We've spent five minutes on that one, which is fine, but we also have a load of others and only fifteen minutes left. So the next one is: Is the only solution to accept the broken academia system, which demands a huge amount of unpaid labour? Well, no, it's not. I'm sitting here as an independent researcher in front of you saying, I, you know, it is possible to do this work from outside of academia. There's still quite a lot of unpaid labour. I'm not being paid at the moment on this webinar. I believe all of my other colleagues on the panel and um, from Bristol University Press are doing this in their salaried time. I'm earning nothing for this. But, you know, it's important that I um, support my publisher. We work together. They're not for profit. And it's important to promote my book. So I'm doing this anyway. Um, and the, the second part of that question was, how do we understand this? So do we have to accept the broken academia system? I'm saying, no, we don't. But if you want to be an academic, you probably do have to accept that. And if so, how do we understand this when we know that model is built on the idea of the unencumbered, normatively abled, brackets male academic with a wife who picks up all caring and household responsibilities? I'm just going to link this because I think there was another question further down or at some point about do we all, oh, I saw, did see a question at some point about, you know, how many of us do pay for help with ha housework? I do, have done for years. There's a lot of things I don't pay for. I don't buy, I don't use makeup. I don't wear jewellery. I don't go to the beauty salon. I get my hair cut by somebody very cheap who comes to my house. You know, I don't spend much money on um, those kinds of things. But getting my ha getting help with my housework is a massive luxury for me and makes my life so much easier and also provides some in employment for somebody who needs it, uh, which is no small thing. Um, but what do, what did Jen, we didn't, Jennifer, we didn't hear from you the last time. And I think this question is a bit of a Jennifer question. Do you want to say a bit about um, your thoughts on all of that? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think we should accept the, the broken system. I do think there's definitely a model of the, you know, the, and I referred to it in, in the book and, and just now of this idea that the ideal academic is someone who he has a personal life that is completely separate and he has people to look after his children if he should have them. I remember in uh, COVID there was um, someone who talked about writing a book in six weeks um, because you know if you want to do something then you can and it turns out that he had teenage kids but I don't think he saw them because his wife just looked after them the whole time 
Um, and it's something that we definitely see in science. Um, and there was a question further down about fertility window. And I think this is something that really hits academics, particularly in science, particularly in chemistry, where there's a huge dropout rate um, during post PhD. And they don't just leave academia, they leave science altogether. And I was one of those. After I had my um, daughter, I actually went on to do two and a half years of a PhD in computational chemistry and then left and then thought I'd, I'd honestly try to forget that it had ever happened. I think one of the ways that I try and address it now is to draw attention to it. So, for example, if I'm having a meeting with a DVC at my university um, who says, oh, we can just do it like this. I'm like, well, doing it like that means I have to stay up till midnight every night. And I don't think that's OK. And, you know, I think there's a, an acceptance that people will work that hard. Um, and there are some things that I do care about and I do over and above, but I want that brought attention to so that the people realise that, you know, it's not actually all right to ask that. And hopefully that we model a healthier balance. Um, I'm actually in a room with uh, my lovely colleague who's studying for PhD. I'm not sure that she would say I have a particularly healthy work life balance, but I try to make sure that she doesn't work too hard. Great. Thank you. Right. Well, here's one for Ilaria now. Thinking about high impact activities, as you mentioned, would you say that in general publications are high impact? Obviously, they're high effort. Um, and the question says, I've worked hard on publishing papers, but by themselves, all they seem to be is a number. So is it worth the time put in? Very good question. It depends on where you are, both in terms of academic context and your discipline. So in UK academia, yes. So publications, it also depends on which publication. So for example, I was told very recently that the only thing that counts in my uh, organizational behavior kind of like business um, world is uh, four star or three stars or top level journal articles and not to write books because it's a waste of time. As you can see, I've got my own ideas about this, uh, but I know that by writing the book, I am consciously choosing not to dedicate that time to writing articles, which are, you know, the most impactful for my career, really. Um, so I think it depends on where you are. It depends on what you want. Like if you need, for example, probation or promotion, then you might need to follow, follow those criteria. Um, and I think you know, it, it really depends on where you are, but usually, yes. Great, thank you. In fact, there's a couple more quick ones for Ilaria. Can you elaborate a bit more on your visualization board, how you use it, how often you update it, and what titles you use for your columns? Oh, yes, I will show for you. <laughs> so I actually did this uh, upon return from maternity leave because I felt that I had, I think at the time, 12 research projects, and I'm actually not on a research contract. so. So it was becoming a bit too much and I work really well with like visual learning. So the first board says in preparation, sorry, in preparation. And these are all articles or books working. So things that I've already started drafting and they might be in a full draft, just not ready to be sent. These are the ones that I have already sent. So they're things that I sent to, you know, usually uh, journals. Um, the other one is things that are currently in review. So as you can see, at the moment, we haven't got anything on review, but we've got some uh, submissions that are in the second or third iteration of revisions. These have been accepted, and these are special issues that I'm working on. And I'm also a co-editor-in-chief of a journal. So I, to, basically, every time there is a movement on something, I change, I shift the column. And that helps me keep track of where everything is. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, Tanisha Ellis says the problem is not that I have a schedule, but sticking to it. Do you have any ideas to increase consistency? I'm going to throw a quick one in, which is build rewards into your schedule, proportionate rewards um, for yourself at different milestone points and make sure you get those rewards. It's a kind of form of self-care. Um, I also have one colleague who buys herself a fancy new piece of underwear every time she gets a rejection. Uh, which I think is kind of a nice way uh, to, to manage that, to celebrate the fact that she's got that far and we'll move on to the next thing. Um, so do other people have other thoughts about how to increase the consistency of sticking to a schedule? Um, well, could I maybe come in on that one, Helen? Mm -hmm. um, yep. It's like Ilaria said, you know, know yourself. So um, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a person who likes to come in early and um, be a bit sort of like lazy but productive 
So I don't stress myself to like get the production done during that time, but I schedule some time to get into the headspace and um, a kind of regular thing. So it becomes a kind of a habit. So I, I go, I arrive, I'm the first person who arrives in the college cafe. I'm there, they give me the coffee. I sit in my corner and uh, I also have time to greet and, and build my relationships with my colleagues, you know, just personal hellos and chit chat. And I don't mind if they interrupt me and I don't get annoyed about it at all because it's part of the self-care and also caring for the academic community. Um, and then have another like a little blitz time, like a 30 minute slot a couple of times a week where you can catch up with yourself and not beat yourself up about not sticking to the schedule because we have a lot of tasks and we have a lot of short deadlines. So it's really quite, you know, acceptable, I think, to not meet every single deadline on the nose. As long as you're not, you know, going wildly over and not even bothering to give excuses. I mean, you know, try and plan. If you need more time, ask for it. Um, because we are all busy people. We understand. Generally speaking, if editors can give you more time or whatever, they will. But, you know, within, yeah, within reasonable parameters. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I would say. And build in a little bit of time to catch up. And, and then also just do a little bit of, you know, like, yeah, like as Helen says, reward yourself with a, yay, I met my goals or, mm, okay, that wasn't great, but, you know, I'll confess to it and get on with the, the next thing. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I was just going to say one thing I do um, is to have a list of tasks that I need doing. So, for example, it's upside down. That's everything I've got to do at the moment. Um, and I'll let myself choose from that. So sometimes I'll want to do one task more than another rather than scheduling. I have to do this thing today. I can, you know, it keeps my monkey brain satisfied so I can be flitting from one thing to another. But I am still making progress because sometimes you're only in the mood for admin. Sometimes you're in the mood to spend a whole time writing something creative and you can't necessarily plan that in advance. Well, I can't definitely. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, I just want to add something. Sorry, I know I'm taking too quick, long. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, so I've made myself these little A6 cards because I, if you can't write it on this small thing, yeah, to do, uh, to chase up a contact, to get, to contemplate, and have this little tiny space to contemplate things. Um, and I have that every day. And I got them like printed poshly as a present to myself. And if you can't get it, write it down on the one card for the day or the week. In fact, one does me for about a week. Um, it's a nice little thing to give yourself. Mm. Good. Brilliant. Let's just move on to the next one. This is one for you, Thu Ming. Do you feel that international comparisons would be a fruitful exercise? This is coming from a single academic, academic mother at a French university who says she's impressed to see how advanced we are in the UK, which is not where you are, but you can comment on this, with regard to reflecting on the work-life balance of female academics. Is this because neoliberalism has already done a lot of damage in British and Anglophone academia? Yes, indeed. OK, so uh, are international comparisons fruitful? Yes. And international in international comparisons, because I do work on critical university studies and international comparisons of academia in different countries. And I would say that the, and because I live in Ireland, which which has a, a post-colonial tendency to always compare itself to to the UK and try to become like it, but with a bit of a time lag in a kind of not very good way. And a lot of what I'm doing to kind of avoid uh, overburdening ourselves is not to be like the UK. So in comparison, the UK is not a good um, uh, culture. It's just in terms, not, not that all academic culture is bad, but in the UK, but the trends are very uh, stressful and undermining of the actual work that we do in research and teaching and all the other work of universities. So yes, I do think international comparisons are fruitful, but I think that international rankings are not. So international rankings, international uh, impact agendas, international indicators of esteem and competition, which are commercial in their basis and uh, specifically competitive in a kind of kill and die way are not fruitful. And uh, avoiding them and criticizing them is fruitful. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. So uh, moving swiftly on, um, someone struggling as an early, early career researcher to divide their time between learning about research methods, scoping their topic, attending topic related conferences, etc. Any advice? 
Ilaria, Jennifer? I would go back to what I mentioned before. So the way I've approached this is to look at what is the most important thing, the what is you know the most impactful thing for me to do right now. And you know what I can do with the time and, and commitments I have and what the you know what the effort involved would be. And you know, it could be that you know I can do something today and then prioritize that and then do something another time. Um, I think multitasking as in doing everything at the same time is exhausting and probably not going to help. And I think another thing I will just mention briefly is to build in buffer zones of breaks. Uh, because breaks are not earned, they should be part of, 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 of your schedule because your mind needs them and your body as well. <laughs> If I can just join in, I think that's incredibly important. It's something that I do not do very well is building breaks for myself. Um, I think another thing in terms of uh, dividing your attention and uh, prioritizing is to make sure that you as well as finding your community, the people who kind of work, who you can get that support with, is to have a mentor. So it's someone that you trust, someone that you like, and someone who can say, do you know what, this is going to help you progress and this isn't, or this is really worthwhile doing, but have you thought about doing it this way so that you can double up your time, for example? We, we know that mentoring is really useful for women in particular, for anyone who's marginalized. And I think we need to ask, and we need to use those mentors. Um, can I just add quickly a point? Very about, quickly, very, very quickly. quickly about, um, yeah, investing in the medium to longer term. And besides scoping your topic, it's important to scope your specialized research community. So within your discipline uh, conferences, there are research committees or research networks that work broadly on the your kind of around your topic area and to find this community because they set the agenda and they are a more long term investment in how your topic develops and insert you into the network of influential people who will influence how the topic is shaped. So invest in those research networks, the research com communities or committees um, for your specific topic, not just you know, trying to get to the leading edge of your topic itself so that you can become part of the leading edge in the medium to longer term. Brilliant, thank you. I'm gonna have to stop. I'm afraid we can't um, go to any more questions because this webinar has just ended and we are all going to self-destruct uh, in a moment that we will all ping off um, the internet. But uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. It's lovely to see so much interest in this topic, which we all think is really important. Um, and then we're getting some lovely comments in the chat. So I'm glad you've all found it helpful. It's been lovely having everybody with us. And we might have a think about whether we can um, take this forward or um, do another such event because there's such a big level of interest. It's been really, really useful. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending. That's been great. And thanks to all the panelists for your time and your input. And thanks to uh, Bristol University Press, Policy Press for hosting. Really appreciate all of that and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.